Thanks very much. I appreciate you having me. I want to, I'm delighted you're here, and I'm delighted to partner with uh, Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship on this on this interesting topic. A couple quick housekeeping notes. I'm fairly active on Twitter, so likewise, if you'd like to share any of these insights or ideas or continue the conversation beyond the session, I'd encourage you to use uh, the Twitter handle, and we're using the hashtag Mile, M-I-L-E. So again, I want to make sure this doesn't become just a single session and we continue the conversation. As you heard earlier, I want to talk to you about really share insights on the sharing economy. Uh, it really is a dynamic landscape. Like any other really interesting, progressive, forward-thinking idea, it must evolve. Uh, and I want to share with you some, some of those best practices. Very quickly, as you heard about my background, I'm originally from Iran. I came to the U.S. in 1981 with a suitcase, $100 didn't know anybody and didn't speak a word of English. Uh, I came here to go to school, started at, uh, in engineering, I think because my parents wanted me to, very quickly transferred to computer science. And I was just fascinated by both the art and science of business. So undergrad in, in management and then uh, graduate school at Emory University in Atlanta for an executive MBA. I, I do live in Atlanta. Uh, if you remember the Olympics, I think the Olympics put us on the map. Uh, the, my, my joke is that, that uh, you're never a hero in your own hometown. So I'm typically on the road about 150 to 200 days a year with uh, working with global clients. I do a lot of work around sales, marketing, business development, growth, I'm really thinking strategically about how do we think very differently about our, our work. And I'm, uh, I'm just my background is really consulting, and I also spent a number of years at a private equity firm where we did 110 transactions in six years. So really got a chance to see great ideas, uh, great ideas scale. But I've also seen a lot of uh, both functional teams take mediocre ideas to new heights, and I've seen dysfunctional teams take amazing ideas off a cliff. I do have a young family, and, and I tell you my story because I genuinely believe every one of us has a story. And, and fundamental to this notion of a sharing economy, as, as we'll talk about in a second, is trust. And trust between the providers, the consumers, the ecosystem, if you will, is absolutely critical in that what you can transparency, what you convey in your unique value propositions, in fact, what you deliver. And if you think about, and I'll talk in a few minutes about those who have come and gone, right? And I'm talking about early stage companies that raised hundreds of millions of dollars that are no longer around was because they couldn't really convey a compelling enough value proposition and gain critical mass. Conversely, those that have stayed, and, and again, at the last, last evaluation, it's about a $17 billion valuation of just literally a dozen or so companies that are global, that have really taken off, they fundamentally understand the stories and individual stories, and they highlight those, and they really reinforce this value of trust. So in terms of our agenda for today, again, in the 30, 35 minutes, 40 minutes that I'm going to you know, share some insights, and then I'm happy to take questions, I want to really talk about this notion of collaborative consumption. The sharing economy has also been called the peer-to-peer -peer economy, but it really started with a, with a fascinating talk around this idea of collaborative consumption. I want to talk about the evolution of it, kind of where do we see it, you know, kind of where it's come from, where do we see it going. And then really, I'm a big believer of any time you see a unique business model, there's probably, there's some fundamental components that work really well. So I'm going to peel back, in, in our vernacular, peel back the onion and really show you some of the core fundamental success stories and what I believe you can leverage in not just, not just learning from this new business model, but thriving in it. And really, how do we leverage some of these ideas moving forward? So it, it's, it's interesting to, to remember that it was just five years ago that a woman named Rachel Botsman uh, you know, delivered a, a pretty passionate you know, TED talk on this notion of a collaborative consumption. And, and she used the analogy of a drill, right, a, a, a power drill. And, and she said, you know, how many of you do you own one of these things? And, 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 and she shared interesting ideas about the average power drill in the garage gets about 15 to 17 minutes of use through its lifetime. So why go out and buy that drill? Because you don't really want that drill. What you want is a hole in your wall to hang a painting. Right? That's the outcome. That's the result you're after. 
or what do most of us do? We buy, we, we go buy a drill, we use it once or twice, then it sits in our garage or in our basement, and it's in essence an underutilized asset. And the whole notion of a collaborative consumption was whether it's individuals, and I think the bigger opportunity here is, is also organizations who have underutilized assets uh, that there's someone else that would have an immediate need and a productive need for that asset. And, and that the owner of that asset could obviously generate some, some passive income from it, right? The challenge is, as I said earlier, you're, you're in essence asking sides to unknown entities, to unknown individuals to trust you. So I'll talk about Uber in a second or Airbnb in a second. You know, I'm, I'm using Uber a great deal, uh, and I've used it in multiple countries, including Dubai on a recent trip. You're, in essence, counting on Uber as an organization to have vetted the drivers, right? So this person is safe, this person is clean, this person has a good record, this person is not a criminal, this person is not going to... So not just a foundational, but here's the next level. This person is going to be prompt. Think about it. Uber wouldn't stay in business long if those drivers didn't show up in the estimated time the technology says they would. Uber's, you know, again, giving you the perception that they're knowledgeable and they're drivers and they know how to get you from point A to point B, that they're going to be clean. And I've complained several times where I've gotten the Uber cars and they, they looked, they were trashed or they weren't very pleasant. So, so this whole notion of trust, both fundamental as well as really the next level is really the foundation of which not only collaborative consumption was built upon, but it is the currency of exchange. It is fundamental to any of these business models taking off in a viable way. So like any other interesting idea, once it's, you know, we say the cat is out of the bag, once everybody hears about it, then everybody jumps on the bandwagon. So if you just, sure, if you just search in your favorite search engine, the sharing economy, you will literally come up with thousands of articles and mentions and everybody from NPR and TED and Forbes and Fortune and Harvard Business Review early on really jumped on it and really hailed it as it is the end all to be all. You remember when um, the websites w were mentioned as they're going to completely put newspapers and radio and even TV out of, out of business? Well, guess what? Many of us still, maybe baby boomers or older generation, love the feel of a paper. I, to this day, I still love getting the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or Financial Times and, and reading through the paper. Even Time magazines jumped in and said, you know, the sharing economy is going to change the world. Has it created an impact? Absolutely. But it also reinforces, if you haven't had a chance to find the, the Gartner hype cycle, uh, anytime a new idea is shared or comes out, there's just this enormous amount of hype, right? And all these, um, you know, talking heads or all these predictions of how it will dramatically change all of our lives. And, and then it kind of, you know, realism sets in, right? And what happens is you see the early players, right? I uh, Ikomoto, uh, crowd rent, share some sugar. It, it literally was an idea of sharing things from your neighbors. Um, now, and again, each of these companies came about, and of course, with, with a whole lot of you know, venture capital sitting on the sidelines looking for good business to invest in, they just poured all kinds of money into these companies without thinking, I may really like my neighbor on one side, but I don't really like the person on the other side. Or I may know my neighbors two or three houses down, but I don't know my neighbor five houses down. And, and that notion of trust can't just be talked about, right? Uh, I, I'm coaching a lot of, lot of Westerners, North Americans in particular, stop telling people to trust me because they don't. Trust fundamentally has to be felt. It has to be experienced. And again, uh, you know, having been born in the Middle East, having done a lot of work in the Middle East, it, it's very intuitive for us that trust has to be felt through our genealogy, through our family, through our multiple dealings, right? It cannot just be described on a website, number one. Number two, again, the, the original collaborative consumption talk was about sharing a drill. As drills become less expensive, is it really worth the time and effort to get on a website and register and search for something that now I can go 15 minutes down the street from where I live and pick one up for not 150 or $200, but drills have now become $30.
So what is that point of diminishing return where all your time and effort and invested resources just doesn't make sense? Now, there's a reason you know Uber and Airbnb and some of these other ones are succeeding, right? Uh, in order for me to, you heard earlier, I, I travel extensively. So it is a royal pain to go try to rent a car or you know find a taxi and you know and, and especially if you go to remote locations, wait for one and even renting a car. So I'm not just taking less taxis, I'm renting cars less because by the time I go to my rental company and get a car and figure out a map of where I'm going and if you're in Manhattan or if you're in Beijing, finding a space becomes a challenge whereas Uber can just drop, drop me off. So the value far outweighs the invested time, effort, resources. So the trust fact, and by the way, many of them were you know, hailed as brilliant companies and what's funny is they're no longer in business. Right, brilliant companies that may have had an interesting idea, but in many ways they were science projects, and they didn't know what they wanted to be when they grow up. And and again, all kinds of you saw Time Magazine earlier, The Guardian, and a whole bunch of other ones. Again, just continue to hail. By the way, Neighbor Goods is no longer in business, right? So we continue to put these companies on a pedestal without really understanding fundamental to their to their success, fundamental in what makes them work. If you think about the, the, the prominent ones, Airbnb, right? This is a, a picture of available Airbnb locations in lower Manhattan just two years ago. Look at the available locations in lower Manhattan today. So this proliferation of choice, right, and the word of mouth, the things that have made a lot of traditional businesses successful is now accelerated through this notion of I try it, have a good experience. It, it was fantastic. Now I'm going to share socially with a whole lot of friends and colleagues, and that's a big reason why a lot of these ideas take off. If you also look at comparatively some of the better sharing economy examples like Airbnb with traditional sources, right? Again, Lower Manhattan, pink is available Airbnb locations, active bookings, blue is available hotels. Consumers, whether B2C or B2B, always appreciate choice and they always want choices, always want opportunities for um, a better value, not necessarily the cheapest, not necessarily the cheapest, but a better value and a, and a greater, much greater convenience, right? So if I'm staying, right, uh, you know, around the park, I don't want to, you know, the nearest hotel is five, six, ten blocks away and if it's winter or right, right now we've had about ten days of rain in Atlanta, if it's, if it's nasty weather, I'd much rather be closer to where I need to get to, right? And and more of a, a home feel, more of a comfortable feel. By the way, full disclosure, Marriott's one of my clients. Marriott gets online and talks about how they're going to add 30,000 rooms in the next year. Well, the CEO of Airbnb says, well, that's great. We'll do that in the next two weeks. So the other really advantageous perspective of sharing economy is this opportunity to scale because it's not just incremental scale. It's exponential scale. Right? Think of Airbnb scaling 30,000 rooms in two weeks and they don't own any of those rooms. Similarly, Uber doesn't own a single one of its cars, right? So it has enormous opportunity to scale. The other fascinating thing that, that's really evolving is now websites that give you enormous amount of, again, transparency on how that service is doing. So this is Airbnb. It not only this website on the right hand side, top of the right corner, you can see I can drill down by city and I can show you the number of Airbnb locations, which ones are being rented more often, what type of room it is, what's the going rate, right? How many days, how many nights in a year is it active? What's the average rate? What's the estimate of occupancy? On and on and on and on. So not only that asset but the productivity of that asset is also becoming visible. And again, it goes back to a, a level of transparency that we've never seen before. That it just sent, it tends to be uh, very much indicative of this, of this approach. So how is this sharing economy evolving? How is it, um, you know, where is it working well? Where is it not working well? Where are some areas you kind of see it um, growing? Well, guess what? The sharing economy has actually been around for a while. You, you remember, you know, sharing rides with friends at university or, or, or sharing resources you've had? 
And what a lot of people don't realize, and I know this particular slide is a little difficult to read, but I'll share my slides with the mile folks, and you're welcome to download or to get access to it afterwards. It, it started back in the 1970s, where, where two thought leaders would publish a paper on community structure, and this idea of collaborative consumption wasn't initially a TED Talk. And as you look through its journey, um, you know, Airbnb started as Airbed and Breakfast, launched in 2008, because college, you know, a couple of college students couldn't figure out how to pay their rent. And they decided to rent out literally a mattress, a bed, in their apartment. Right? So as it's taken off, a lot of interesting ideas have come and gone. Uh, a lot of interesting ideas uh, are, you know, again, were interesting projects. And you're starting to see bigger and bigger brands jump in. Uh, and, and you're starting to see a lot of different, again, I'll show you categories in a second, and you're starting to see the globalization uh, and really capital infusion. More recently, unfortunately, certainly in the States, you're seeing now more legal action and litigation uh, because of, of um, the economic impact it has on certain markets. Uh, to this day in the U.S., you go to some major cities, and again, this is this is almost eight years after their initial you know, initial launch. Um, you can't get Uber because the local city who charges taxis and limos a tax can't do the same thing with Uber drivers. But I said earlier, consumers in particular always find a choice, always find options. So one particular city that comes to mind is Orlando. If you visited the states or if you visited Orlando to visit Disney World for your family vacation, uh, the city of Orlando does not allow Uber on the airport property. So this is literally what consumers do, is they either take a, a hotel shuttle off the airport property and then call Uber, uh, or uh, you know have Uber pick them up upstairs like they're a friend, right? Or literally I've heard of individuals catching a taxi just to get out of the airport area and then call Uber to take them into the city or take them where they need to go to. So what I don't believe, again, regulations and laws, and there was a, uh, a recent you know, vote in the San Francisco area to try to limit how many nights you could stay in a particular Airbnb location or how many rides you could take on, a, uh, on Uber. I don't believe laws and regulations are the answer. It's just like restricting people's access to Facebook or YouTube from work. That's not the answer. The answer is how do we find ways to work within, work really around and through this environment. Uh, the other interesting uh, data that I found was, was a lot of stories, right? I mentioned, you know, the hype economy and, and, and as, as an interesting idea takes off, a lot of people think, you know, you see a lot of articles about it, right? Early on, it was, and, and, you know, it was this notion of collaborative consumption, as I mentioned. And then another word for it is the 1099. 1099 is a U.S. tax um, code where, and here's the fascinating, one of the fascinating aspects of, of the sharing economy is nobody's an employee. Everybody's a contractor. And in the U.S., 1099 is what you issue to contractors. So several people wrote the 1099 economy or the on-demand economy. Whereas if you look, right, since 2013, a lot written about the sharing economy, unfortunately, it's on the decline because it's no longer perceived to be flavor of the, of the day. And you see all kinds of, there was a Fast Company article, why the sharing economy is dead, or how the sharing, you know, recent Forbes, as of literally a week ago, a recent Forbes article about the sharing economy really doesn't increase productivity. Or what they're doing is they're going back to traditional economic definitions of productivity of input, capital, and output, and you're right, it doesn't. But what it does is it, it helps you, as I said earlier, really leverage those underutilized assets. And particularly in the U.S., not exclusively, but particularly in the U.S., it's very much a consumption economy. We consume. Again, I remember growing up in Iran, and whether your washing machine or dishwasher or any other appliance died, my dad would call a, 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 a mechanic or technician, and they would come to the house and fix our washing machine. Unfortunately, in some ways I feel like in the U.S. or maybe a larger part of the West, when that washing machine dies, we just literally throw it out and buy another one. So we've become, in a very unhealthy way, I believe, um, all about consumption. How could I consume more? Uh, you know, do you really need 
five watches? Do we really need 20 pair of shoes? Do we really need, you know, there are homes now that have three, four cars. Last time I checked, there's only two adults in that home that can drive that car. And think about it, that car is going to sit in the driveway or sit in the garage while they're at home at work most of the day, right? So all this consumption creates a lot of manufacturing, creates a lot of production, but there are underutilized assets. There's not enough utilization of what's happening. So if you look at the evolution of the sharing economy, by the way, last count, 9,500 companies, 130 countries, 1,500 cities, 25 distinct categories, and $8.5 billion in US dollars in funding, not just the value of the companies, I'll show you that in a second, in funding. What are some of the more popular categories? Obviously, business and innovation, technology and data, finance and economics, food and drink, and real estate are some of the, the, the more popular categories, but by no means are they the only ones. Look at all the different categories in which now there are at least some, and again, I'm going to show you a, a much more fascinating, much more interesting approach to this, but some really unique players. I mean, fashion. And it makes you wonder, you know, kid stuff. Uh, I don't know if you have, uh, I have a young family. I, I don't know if you have kids, you have grandkids. They grow up so fast that between clothing and toys, there's a very limited um, lifeline or life expectancy of that toy or of that clothes. I, my son is growing rapidly. You buy him a pair of pants, and in a month, they're too short. Well, those are brand new. He's worn them once. So today, you know, we may find other family members. Again, in the U.S., we call it hand-me-downs, right? We may hand that down to somebody else. But as you, you start to run out of family members to give stuff to, right? Or may, you don't ever want to insult somebody and say, hey, here's a, a used clothing. But you know what? It is thriving in terms of traditional stores. They're called consignment stores. There are physical stores here. Well, why couldn't I do the same thing online? Um, entertainment, right? If you've ever purchased a DVD, you know, you buy that DVD, you watch it once or twice, and then it goes in a library, well, and you may not watch it again for some period of time, where there's others who haven't seen that DVD. Well, now with streaming, that's a little less attractive, but the point is that, again, underutilized asset that's sitting around most of our homes. Travel, we talked about seasonal and holidays. Real estate, we talked about. So there's a lot of books, right? I have a fantastic library at my home, but I may reference those books after I read them once. Periodically, it's just that, a reference point, whereas others may, may find it of value. So literally, uh, recently, this is uh, we're seeing this more and more in front of uh, homes, where there's a traditional mailbox for the mail carrier. Now we're seeing these um, almost impromptu libraries pop up. They're, they're, they're weatherproof libraries in front of people's homes by their mailbox where people can you know, borrow a book and bring it back and, and put another one in. So the same idea is happening, again, online with several sources. This is actually one of the better uh, explanations I've seen. A guy named Jeremiah Wyang has created this collaborative economy honeycomb. And let me just share some ideas with you. I love the notion of a honeycomb because if you think about it in its natural state, honeycombs are incredibly resilient structures that enable a, a lot of individual, in terms of, in this case, bees, but in, the, in, in terms of what we're talking about, individuals to access, share, and grow the resources among a common group, right? There has to be a glue. There has to be some common traits that keeps these folks together. As I mentioned earlier, 9,500 plus companies They've done a really interesting uh, mapping of this where there's six inner tracks. Think of them as the original uh, spaces where, where this idea took off money, right? The whole peer-to-peer -peer lending, goods, food, services, transportation, space, uh, in terms of, of uh, available locations, if you will. Then what they found out was there was an additional six that kind of extended beyond that. Uh, and again, at the center of it is the empowered people, right? They're, they make, they co-create. By the way, it's the title of my next book that I'm working on. Uh, they crowdfund their, their peers, their customers, and those roles change all the time, right? And what happened is they found the six outer tracks of learning. If you think of uh, the Khan Academy or, or Thinkful uh, or Gibbon, these are all Skillshare. These are all examples of peer-to-peer uh, versus instructor-led learning that's, that's taken off in a big way. Um, areas like health and wellness, 
uh, areas like uh, logistics, uh, corporate is an interesting one. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of really interesting corporate solutions, whether it's employee services, supply chain, uh, private label, take off in a big way. Utilities, that's a, that's a really interesting one. Right? How do we share uh, utilities? Uh, and of course, municipal. That's, a, that's a, one of the last remaining um, areas that are just, uh, again, we use the vernacular of, of kludgy, right? It's, it's uh, to this day, if I want a driver's license, I have to go stand in line for hours, uh, and, and it's just an incredibly antiquated system. Or voting. Voting is another one that's just a really uh, challenging one to, to overcome, which this environment could really, really leverage in a big way. Early on, we're seeing in municipal uh, equipment and safety take off. And, and if you'd like to see this or if you'd like to learn more about it, that's the website, just mesh.it. Uh, Mesh.it is is uh, the new author on a book on this on this topic, and you can download this uh, collaborative honeycomb, and they're keeping up with it themselves. Uh, the other challenge is, is as soon as I mention a company uh, on on these these webinars, unfortunately, several months later, they run out of funding and they're no longer around. And it's it's funny to read articles where people are talking about a company where this, they're no longer in existence. That's how fast this, this market is evolving. That's how fast a lot of these companies, if they cannot find a unique value proposition and really convey that value proposition, uh, are, are going by the website, wayside. So let's talk about how do we leverage that? How do you, how do you really thrive in this, in this world? So I'm always interested in, in what's really different about a business model. Well, first and foremost, and, and my good friend Bajan Kusravi uh, is writing about, you know, just wrote a, a Forbes article, again, just a few days ago, about if you're starting a company, if you're thinking about starting a new venture within your existing enterprise or outside of it, really thinking about that that uh, sharing economy models goes a long way. So if you if you peel again, peel back the onion, if you look at some of the key attributes, first and foremost, uh, the sharing economy workforce is dramatically younger. This is how the millennial, right, the 18 to 24 year olds think. Uh, the days of maybe you know you and I or our parents working for the same company for three, five, ten, fifteen plus years, I believe, are 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 gone. Uh, there's there's less of a um, need to stay somewhere for that perceived uh, stability. The only stability that that you can count on is are these employees learning? Are they growing? So if you just if I just look at the U.S. workforce compared to the sharing economy, it just dramatically it's a younger workforce. Number two, they're dramatically much better educated. Right? If you look at the traditional US population, you have a lot of high school graduates, you have some college, but as you get into advanced degrees, you'll see that more and more the sharing economy is just more educated. They're also earning more. Right? So again, if you look at lodging managers in terms of, of um, you know, I, I manage a, a bed and breakfast or I manage a small hotel or motel. Uh, if I'm in the, the housekeeping, if I work in a hotel, if I'm a, a courier or a messenger, if I'm a taxi or limo service, if I just take the top four, the hourly earning of the sharing economy employees is higher. And, and so that lodging manager, Airbnb, is making passive income. They don't actively have to be there. If you got manual labor in terms of sharing, that's higher. Delivery, higher. Ride sharing, dramatically higher. So, so they're earning, think about it. If they have a higher hourly earning, contribute in many ways to the middle class. And the rising middle class is often what improves any kind of city or local economy. There's also one of the concerns is valuations, right? So value of a company. Uh, you know, when Uber's valuation in terms of billions of dollars is approaching the valuation of Ford or General Motor, Motor when, when you look at Airbnb, uh, reaching the valuation of, of Hilton or Marriott with, with thousands of global real estate assets. When you can look at Lending Club reaching the valuation of Western Union or, or eBay in some ways, uh, reaching the value of, of, you know, exceeding the value of Target, which has, again, uh, thousands of, of locations, you start to worry of are they overinflated? Are they overvalued? So let me toggle over to the web a second because I want to show you a, a couple of interesting, interesting uh, facts. Look at this. 
sharing economy has created 17 billion dollar companies, right? So eight in California, that's the Uber, Lending Club, Prosper, Instacart, Airbnb, one in Texas, three in New York, one in UK, one in India, uh, Ola, one in China, Australia, New Zealand. These are all sharing companies, sharing economy companies that um, have really taken off in a big, big way. And again, I'll send this link to the mile folks as well. You're welcome to read more about this article on your own. But one of the concerns about the sharing economy is actually the valuation. So what are, what are Facebook, IKEA, WhatsApp, Uber, in some ways, and Apple, right? Some of these more progressive companies have in common. If you look at their business models, Facebook creates no content. Its users, in many ways, its customers are who creates the content. IKEA, uh, if you have one uh, near you, uh, you go to an IKEA, a, a Swedish furniture store, and, and the buyer right, does the assembly. All the furniture comes in boxes uh, that you literally carry in a big warehouse, you carry out of the store, and, and you go home and you assemble this together. So they've taken out a huge labor pool. In essence, the customers provide the labor. If you look at MasterCard, the credit card company, the merchants who are its customers are providing this service provisioning. Uh, and so, so in essence, the service provider and the user provide the labor. Uh, look at WhatsApp. Again, there's no infrastructure. The users provide that network infrastructure. Uber, we talked about earlier, there's no, they don't own a car. It's all the, the drivers, in essence, their customers uh, provide that free fleet. So the platform that they've built allows them to supply the infrastructure for free. Apple. Apple is the quintessential company in this world, right? So the users, the buyers, the developers, also buyers, in essence, are developing the apps. So Apple itself develops very few applications. It's the user community that's creating that. So the product platform enables third party to really provide enormous amount of value. In essence, the strategic relationships they build. If you want to evolve your business, if you want to get into this business, the strategic relationships you build, in essence, accelerate that digital business model and really help um, not only bring you to market faster, but generate revenue, generate profitability from that business model at an accelerated rate. This, by the way, this is also very true in, in, in creating that experience, right? So more and more, as we travel, think about it a second. You know, we're looking for that consistent experience across different parts of our lives. Travel is a big one. I want the website to act the same way as my tablet does, the same way my smartphone does, the same way the kiosk at the airport does, the same way in-flight entertainment inside the plane does. So that consistent look and feel is also driving the need for that same experience, whether I buy something or I share it with someone else. I was in Orlando, Florida a couple of weeks ago where Gartner had its uh, symposium, annual symposium, and, and they talked about, you know, this is going to continue to evolve. So I don't know if you wear any of those um, health and wellness uh, devices. I wear a Fitbit that tracks my, 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 you know, how far I've walked and my diet and my sleep. And, but imagine in just a couple of years, two million employees wearing those health and fitness devices as a condition of their employment. Well, guess what? That employee leaves, that company now has that device to share with another employee. So this is where we believe corporate is going to even become that much more prevalent. 25 billion sensors, 25 billion sensors by 2020, just a few years away. Again, those sensors are going to become assets that will move and they're going to be shared. So this is an example of what we believe the sharing economy is absolutely going to evolve. This is a fascinating one that that customer experience really is going to be the only sustainable differentiation. So business models, companies, products, services are going to come and go. The ones that consistently deliver exceptional customer experiences are the ones that are really going to set themselves apart and really show a differentiation. So what do you need to do? Well, you need to manage the present, but you also have to find ways to invent your future. You have to find ways to really think about the evolution of your business. One of my favorite questions to ask a lot of senior executives I work with is how will your business look very differently in 18 to 36 months than it does today? 
that I'm not saying how will you do a little bit more here or a little bit more there or launch one more product or go into one new market. How will it look fundamentally different in 18 to 36 months than it does today? Um, by the way, if you haven't had a chance to, to attend, I highly recommend the Consumer Electronics Show. It's in Las Vegas. It's typically the first couple weeks in January to every executive because you walk around the Consumer Electronics Show, also known as CES, for 15 minutes. Walk around that exhibit hall for 15 minutes and it definitively points that every business, if not every industry, is either currently under attack or soon will be from different mindset, different thinking, different go-to-market approach. So you, to succeed in this, in this evolution, in this sharing economy, you first and foremost have to really think about some business goals. What are some of the drivers? What are some of the strategies? What are the tactics? Answering the question I asked earlier, how will your business look and feel very different in 18 to 36 months, that's typically, that conversation typically starts with a business goal. Then, as you heard earlier, the shareholder, right? Who, you, you, who are your target audiences? Who is underserved? Who is currently not being served or not being served very well by the competitive landscape? So what do they value? Who are they? Where are they? What do they value? That, only by understanding the first two, and really aligning the first two, can you really then create sharing economy market leadership with the strategy, with tactics, with innovation, with capital, with architecture. So you don't have to be a startup. You don't have to be in Silicon Valley. This really could happen anywhere. And again, I'll give you a couple examples in a minute. Um, as you think about the evolution of your business, leveraging assets. Uh, this also there's a new term I heard from a client the other day. Asset, you know, we're taking our business asset light. And I said, well, wait a minute, what does that mean? Well, instead of investing several, you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 million dollars in building an asset, right, can we go look for one that is not being utilized today effectively? I really leverage that to start generating revenue and, by the way, not have that asset sit idle. That's also an example of the sharing economy that's coming up in a big way. We also believe um, the sharing economy requires an evolution of the way you build relationships, specifically digital relationships. You can choose to do nothing, and, and that is certainly your prerogative. Some people are gonna be reactive. Then there's that proverbial chasm, right? And then once you start crossing that, that threshold, you start to become proactive. You start to really think about being predictive. What are we seeing in the market? What are the common traits in our particular geography, in our market? How do we start becoming intuitive? And, and very few really become visionary. Make no mistake about it, if you're functioning on the left-hand side today, you're being transactional. And if transaction is the name of your business, right, God bless you, do well. But if you really want to evolve, you need to start thinking about how do we become transformational? How do we start transforming our business, our relationship with our target audience, the value they get from us, and not just today, but over some period of time. So here's a handful of ideas. Put that client and the needs of that client at the center of all that you are, all that you do not as an afterthought, but really who is that client and, and how do we start anticipating what they need? You really need the digital strategy. You really need to think very differently about, uh, again, optimizing those assets. How do we create world-class engagement? If you've ever stayed in a Ritz-Carlton or a Four Seasons or you know, Jumeirah also has some beautiful, amazing properties, uh, it doesn't get to be any more of a commodity in a hotel room, right? It's a room and a shower and a bathroom, right? Uh, it's suites have you know kitchens and other things, but it's a room. So that experience, that world class engagement, is really what builds that premium brand perception. It really is a very different business model, uh, as you saw some examples I shared with you earlier. I tunify your capabilities. It's all about how do we create an ecosystem, right? If you think about Uber, it's an ecosystem of a company and an app and drivers and passengers, all of that ecosystem, and they build their own mapping technology, right? So it really is um, an ecosystem that comes together that makes the collective much more valuable than any individual part. Digital talent thinks differently. Digital talent behaves very differently. Digital talent grew up with this technology. Uh, my, my son, my young son and my daughter both have multiple devices. They, they use them on a regular basis for home, not just playing but homework. This is what they're growing up with. And guess what? In just a few years, they're going to come work for your company. Do you really think they still want to use your fax machine, right? 
So digital talent thinks very differently. You also want to digitally enable your execution, right? If this idea of some of what I'm sharing with you becomes yet something else you have to do, you'll never really get good at it. You got to really think about what are we trying to execute? What are we trying to implement? How do we, are there other ways to take advantage of that? Analytics, I showed you some examples. The fact that you can see all the available Airbnb locations and how they're managed and how often they're available and you know, those analytics are, are priceless. Um, failing. Uh, the digital, the sharing economy, the digital economy requires a lot of trial and error. And as a mentor are driven into me, if you're not failing, you're not trying. Right? So, so setting aside some resources, whether it's budget or teams or individuals, to really test new ideas and encouraging them to fail, but learn from that failure. By the way, each of your chief financial officers asked me to please fail cheap. Right? But if you fail forward, if you fail fast, if you learn from that failure, it really accelerates that evolution. And you have to really think about ROI, that traditional return on investment, very differently. Uh, I talk about in my most recent book, is the title of it is Return on Impact. Uh, think of return on integration, return on image, return on involvement, uh, return on influence. Not just clever terms, but really soft assets organizations really, really value. In the last few minutes, uh, I want to talk to you about this. this if you think of, of that customer experience, in any industry that customers constantly evaluating. They consider, they discover, they come back to evaluation, they purchase, they use, they come back to evaluation again. So the customer experience you're creating is not just a brand, it's not just a value proposition, but it's also how do you fit in that customer's kind of daily journey? How do you fit, where's your unique position in kind of what they go through on a daily basis? And brands that are, that are successful in many ways are redefining that customer experience. Is it really that big of a deal for me to take out my wallet and pay for something with my credit card? Um, no, not really. But is it, you know, research shows that we're often within three feet of our smartphone. So it's a lot easier for me to pay for something with my smartphone, number one. Number two, now with the Apple Watch or other watches that are coming, and I still believe the killer apps will come, it's just really easy for me to just tilt my wrist to pay for something. But look at all the different players in that payment process, in that experience, that customer expectation and that experience that an Apple Pay, right, or an Apple Watch is going to dramatically impact. So whether you're, and again, I've done a lot of research on this for my next book, whether you're millennials or seniors, whether you use technology in a traditional way for very minimal interaction, whether you experiment with technology and selectively engage in digital and sharing economy tools and sites, whether it's transitional, right, you're leveraging you know, digital more broadly, or you're digitally savvy, we're in essence all digital consumers. We're all today digital consumers, and we're all looking for increased speed and a higher digital customer intensity. I said earlier, a big uh, telltale sign for me from the sharing economy is that a, nobody's an employee. B, huge traction with the millennials. And if you look at this graph, Gen Xs will decline. Baby boomers are on the fastest decline. The silent generation, right? This is our, our, our parents, if not our grandparents, are, are definitely on the decline, decline. Millennials are, uh, they're driving some industry norms. And the, these folks are not going to go away. So for the next 10, 15, 20 years, they're going to continue to become an economic engine and you have to figure out how to engage differently. And if you look at just the, the seamless way that, that they work with retail, they want seamless product offerings, they want seamless integration of your operations, they want seamless IT. I, I don't care how your back end works. Um, I want to be able to order it online and go pick it up from a local store. Uh, and by the way, I want you to collaborate with your partners to even strengthen the value proposition. So I don't believe retail is going to be the only front, only, only industry that's going to dramatically get impacted by these millennial expectations. And if you think about all that they expect, if you think about what they're looking for in their interaction with you, your company, your brand, a lot of those expectations are coming from sharing economy technologies that they're used to using on a daily basis. And they're using on a much more consistent basis, and that mindset is really setting the stage for everybody else. 
Uh, I, this is kind of my presentation side. Obviously, you can learn a lot more from our website, as, as they were kind enough to mention, norgroup.com. There's position papers. There's infographics. Three ways to learn more. Uh, I've captured a lot of this in my most recent book, Return on Impact. There's a newsletter, obviously, on our website that you can subscribe to under resources. We've also built a private community. It's called the NORNET. Uh, this is what it looks like. You're welcome to gain access to other webinars and other information. I, I want to leave you with the 1% rule. Improve by 1% a day, and in 70 days, you're twice as good. It's mathematically proven. Improve by 1% a day, and in 70 days, you're twice as good. So don't get overwhelmed by anything I've shared. Really start thinking about, start internalizing into your respective organizations, what can we start doing 1% better? What can we start doing 1% better today than we did yesterday? How do we make that really more of a cultural effort? I saw this sign in one of my client hallways, and it really resonated with me. And it says, experience is a hard teacher. She gives us the test first, the lessons afterwards. Innovative business models like the sharing economy are testing us. They're testing our resolve. They're testing our ability to think and lead differently. They're thinking, they're testing our ability to really transform our business models. This is what I want for you is to never stop growing. So I want to thank Miles for putting on this session. I want to thank you for, for, for joining. Uh, and I hope that the, this content has been of interest and value to you. Uh, Mr. Jafar, let me turn it back over to you, see if we have any questions from our audience. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Noor. Um, folks, we are now open for the question and answers. If you have any questions, you could either put it in the question box or you could raise your hand. There is a hand icon available on the webinar console, so please click on it. Let me go straight to the caller who has raised a hand. We have our regular caller, Dr. Muhammad Rishad. Doctor, thank you very much, sir. Please introduce yourself and ask a question. Hi, David. Thank you for uh, such a great presentation. I'm a professor here in Saudi Arabia in one of the universities. I, I'm into the business school here. And uh, I just uh, want to thank you for a great uh, eye-opening presentation because I'm also an old-school professor, you know. So uh, my question is that uh, uh, it's, a, it's a thought that uh, with this uh, disruption and innovation and we talk about that collaborative consumption taking place all across the, uh, across the globe. So you think there will be a narrow down of the developed uh, society and the underdeveloped society it will be uh, coming closer? And uh, you think that the scalability will be a, a more impact, um, impactful criteria than the, the developed countries where there was, that, that was a hub for the research and development? So it will be more fragmented, or it will be, you think, in the, in the future still it will be um, concentrated in certain um, blocks or s certain places. And uh, the second uh, thought was that the non-performing assets, so to get a better utilization or the optimization of the resources, so will, will there be any kind, any kind of a mechanism where the physical flow in the supply chain will be more faster and quicker for uh, non-performing assets in some part of the world which can be moved forward. There's something uh, highlighting on that, I, I appreciate if you can give your comments on that. Thanks. So uh, uh, thank you for your kind comments. I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and I appreciate you jumping in with your questions. Let me, let me take one at a time. Um, in terms of proliferation, if you think about what really scales the sharing economy, it really is the, the presence of um, internet access, uh, cell access, and smartphones. So, so there are parts of the world uh, in you know, less developed parts of the world where it's easier for me to get cell service than it is traditional telephone service. And, and as that develops, we believe, and, and this leads to your second question, um, we believe there will continue to be niche players who understand, and, and this, is, this is very true. One of, my, one of my Emory University professors, Dr. Jack Sheff, talks about the rule of three. Uh, in essence, any new market, any new market opportunity, a whole lot of uh, you know companies jump in. Think of the automotive industry the, at the turn of the last century. There were over 200 different car manufacturers, and now certainly, if you look at you know U.S. or even global market, there's typically you know three dominant players, and then there's a whole lot that are in, you know distant places, right? So we believe. Uh, 
uh, as more internet access comes to different parts of the world, as more cell and access and smartphones continue to develop, continue to become less expensive, continue to become more available, you'll identify, you'll see more and more local uh, sharing economy examples take off. And, and here's then what happens next. In their evolution, as they prove themselves, as they prove their business model, as they prove their unique value, they become really attractive acquisition targets. So what people don't know is that Airbnb has done some eight or ten acquisitions just this past year. Uber is doing acquisitions. Uh, Lyft is doing acquisitions. So as they find others who have successfully have penetrated the local market, that's the fastest. Think about it. In terms of scale, I can build it myself. I can partner with somebody or I can go buy somebody. And with $90 billion of capital sitting on the sidelines looking for good deals to buy, the sharing economy is very much going through a consolidation where they're going to continue to acquire um, other local companies that have proven this model works. In terms of uh, flow of digital or of, of physical assets, I don't know if you've seen, I, I think it's fascinating, um, Uber in particular is building a platform. So in Manhattan, they've launched Uber Eats where they'll go to your, forget transporting passengers, they'll go to your local restaurant, favorite local restaurant, buy your food and deliver your food. Or, uh, or, or Uber delivers, right? So you go buy a physical asset from, and again, today it's tested with consumers, but very quickly this will transform the business as well. You buy an asset online, you call them, you buy it, whatever, and an Uber driver will pick it up and deliver it. So that's one. The other one we're seeing is there's two talks, uh, two, two narratives currently playing out in terms of Amazon.com either investing in U.S. Postal Service or buying a chain of gas stations. Think about it a second. Amazon already has mass distribution and they have these distribution centers of those physical goods. Well, what they're struggling with or with the next opportunity is really that last mile. How do we get those physical goods even closer to consumers. By investing in U.S. Postal Service, now they get access to this fleet of delivery vehicles, right, number one. Number two, as more and more cars, um, uh, electric cars are taking off in a big way in the U.S., we physically need those gas stations less and less. So those gas stations who are physical locations, think about putting a second story on that gas station, and now you have a distribution center or distribution access point right around the corner from where you live. So we also believe part of this evolution of sharing economy is going to be absolutely a, a, a much stronger distribution of physical assets, physical goods, and, uh, and not just services. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, uh, David, for your comment. Thanks, Ali, for Likewise. giving me the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have a few more questions. Uh, uh, let me mute Dr. Muhammad. Thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad, for your question. There's another question. What has fueled the expansion of the sharing economy? Sure. So it's a great question. As I said, as I mentioned earlier, it, it really is uh, just a proliferation of, and I'm going to go in this order. Any any time, any place I can get internet access, uh, you know, that's one of the fundamental things you need. Is is think about it, Uber. <laughs> Or, or Airbnb is not going to work without, without internet access, right? It's just a really difficult way to do it. Number two is, is you know, cell service, right? I've got to be able to, and cell services, you know, as these applications become more sophisticated, they got to push more images, right? They got to push more streaming video. So the cell service, those pipes have to continue to get wider. The last, the last piece of this puzzle are the smartphones. Uh, again, Google has announced that we do more searches from our mobile devices, the smartphones, the tablets, than we do you know, ever on a desktop or even a laptop. So as these devices become more sophisticated, as iPhone 6 and 7 and 8, now imagine iPhone 9 and 10, right, become that much more powerful as a device, now it makes this sharing economy concept a lot easier because of, of, of processor speed, because of graphic speed, because of just the capabilities of that of that device. So those three really uh, are, are pouring fuel on a fire to really accelerate both the awareness but also the digital economy applications. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, another one, short one. How do you believe it will continue to evolve in 2016 and beyond? That's a great question. Uh, on the, the honeycomb that I showed you from Mesh.it, uh, one of the, the uh, outer tracks is corporate. Uh, if you've noticed, a lot of sharing economy examples to date, TaskRabbit, uh, where I can really hire individuals to go pick up my dry cleaning or run a task for me. Uh, a lot of the current sharing economy applications are consumer-centric. Well, if you think about it, as individual consumers, we test a lot of ideas. When they work, we have a good experience. But then we go to work, and we see the kludgy, the, the, the disconnected way that, that our business applications or our corporate infrastructure runs. And we start thinking about that copier that's sitting there underutilized. Or if I'm a hotel, let me just use that example for a second. If I'm a hotel and I physically have that hotel, if you think about it, I have conference rooms or meeting rooms in that hotel that sit empty most of the time. So now, and again, several of these companies are my clients, right? So a Hilton Hotel or a Marriott Hotel or an Intercontinental Hotel that has that conference room empty, they're not very good at themselves launching a sharing economy platform and they don't want to make that investment. But there are now, there are now technology platforms that allows a Hilton Hotel to put that conference room or that ballroom or that meeting room up on a website as available and and if you're an entrepreneur let's say you work you run a small company you don't have a big conference room you don't have a big ballroom to put on a, a meeting or an event now I can go to that website and I can rent I can share I can use that that Hilton ballroom without being a guest there or without even having to deal with Hilton Right, so we're seeing a uh, three things: much more utilization of sharing economy examples in the corporate space, much more utilization of corporate assets within sharing economy technology platforms, right? Just like the Hilton ballroom or the conference room example I gave you, and, and I genuinely believe more and more municipalities, more and more city, local governments. I recently spoke to a gathering of. Uh, U.S. mayors and U.S. city government, and if you look at uh, companies uh, or uh, cities like Barcelona, who are leveraging Internet of Things to not only tell their citizens where available parking spaces are, but think about parking space is a sharing asset. Uh, what what trash or what uh, garbage bins are full and they're ready to be picked up? Um, interstate access. Uh, you know, if there's an accident, how do we re redirect that traffic so citizens are not sitting in traffic for extended period of time? Those are all examples where we see city and, and local governments start to use sharing economy to make life just easier for a lot of overpopulated uh, cities and counties and municipalities, if you will. So those are three areas we believe will dramatically leverage and grow through the sharing economy in the next next few years. Thank you very much. We have one last question. Who are some of the more important players beyond Airbnb and Uber? Yeah, you, you're, you're, you're actually going to see more and more of, uh, I want to say traditional companies, but I'm going to add traditional digital companies, right? I mentioned earlier Amazon. Uh, you know, we believe Amazon... Um, if you look at, you know, we've I've studied this extensively. Amazon actually has a weak weak spot, has a has a very very uh, very challenging weak point, which is uh, this past year, Amazon.com uh, charged its customers three estimated three billion dollars in shipping. They spent close to six billion dollars in shipping. That is not sustainable. So Amazon.com, and, and to the professor's question, is going to have to find a way more efficiently, more effectively deliver its physical products to its consumers. Now, if, you, if you've seen the news, you know, delivery with drones that can pick up a box and, you know, deliver it to your front door, that, that's interesting. That's kind of, you know, interesting. But they're going to have to find other ways. And if I can catch an uh, Uber ride for $4, 
right? That dramatically reduces Amazon's Amazon's uh, expense in in just shipping and delivery. So uh, we believe companies like eBay, you know, massive, huge amount of revenue. Companies like Google, companies like Amazon, will will become uh, a much bigger players. Whether they acquire somebody, they invest in them. They invest in other physical assets and start to leverage those underutilized assets. I mentioned earlier, U.S. post offices, gas stations. Uh, those are all examples of bigger companies we believe will jump in, uh, as well as, again, I gave you the example of a hotel with its, with its conference room. Think of all the assets that are inside companies that are underutilized, from that conveyor belt to that manufacturing line to that shipping lane or container, if a container goes out empty, that's an underutilized asset, that's a perishable asset. So, so we're going to see more and more uh, companies jumping in, I believe, through investments in, in the sharing economy examples and companies today. Well, that really brings us towards the end of the webinar. I would like to really thank you, Mr. David Noor, on behalf of Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship, Mild. Any concluding remarks that you would like to give before we dismiss out? My pleasure. I, I appreciate the kind invitation to join you. I, I, as I said earlier to your audience, I, this is, uh, I'm fascinated by, by changing business models. And, and what I want for your audience as well is to never stop growing, never stop learning. Never stop asking, how can we challenge the status quo, not just defend it? Well, once again, thank you very much uh, and for your valuable time that you've given us for this live webinar. And thank you all of those who participated in this webinar. We are recording this. This will be uploaded on Mild Community. So please stay tuned to webinar.mild.org to access the archives and also to learn about our upcoming programs. We are going to conclude this session now, so you all will be automatically dismissed out. You all have a good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're calling from. We'll